Welcome everyone, actually. It's really good to, to see a full house. Um, my name is Alfredo Camerotten, director of Mostin and the president of IKT. And uh, the IKT, for those who are not familiar with, is an international network, is the International Association of Curators of Contemporary Art. It has around 500 registered members. Um, uh, the headquarters is based here, actually, mostly in North Wales at the moment, but it's changing three years, every three years. So every three years, there is this kind of a nomadic structure uh, going around the world with, uh, with, uh, with an elected board member. Uh, team and uh, an elected sort of a um, governance actually structure and uh, we basically produce content for curators professional development uh, uh, an annual um, an annual congress and post congress uh, in which we explore a specific region of the world uh, through their artists their museums their institutions their uh, um, curatorial strategies, their sort of educational program, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. Um, the last couple of years, actually, we went through Miami and Cuba and to Kentucky and Ohio. And this year, actually, later on in September, we will do here in the UK, uh, partially here in North Wales, partially in, in London. Um, next year we have actually, and for 2024, 2025, we have also some sort of further exciting program. Anyway, so this is the the, the network, and um, and just just to mention actually, um, with Auronda um, and Kerry, we, we thought this uh, to put together this webinar um, because in terms of institutional and cultural institution and and the NFT, there is this kind of a uh, I would say skepticism and uh, uh, and uh, and this you know kind of NFT can be uh, can feel sketchy at least the world of NFT it can kind of get rich quick Ponzi scheme sometimes and people are hacked and everyone is anonymous etc uh, etc et but however the NFTs and the crypto art world have arguably ushered some sort of a new era of art changing the way we interpret art we connect with a vaster wider audience um, it generates um, new avenues I would say for artistic expressions and uh, and uh, curatorial um, practices as well and uh, for instance actually the engagement with cultural institution are truly expanded by through these remits um, and uh, and uh, think about for instance the dialogue in the art world that have won through the last I don't know 60 years on artists' compensation, our criticisms, contemporary aesthetics, and how to contextualize this uh, historically, the institutional engagement with new form of art, of which actually crypto art is one of them, uh, collective action, uh, the art center and the art margins, ecological concern, they all have been revisited in the context of this uh, emergent technology. Um, this panel, actually, just to give you uh, um, uh, an overview about our thinking behind organizing it, it's, uh, we'll try to provide some reason for why this technology benefits uh, artists and institutions alike in the long run. Uh, it will dive into the pros and cons of uh, also the uh, metaverse as a digital extension of our physical world. And the panelists here actually uh, will provide some different perspectives in terms of artist perspective, marketplaces, researchers, scholars, um, and uh, and and producers, and uh, and forecast somehow the not the prediction on the future, but at least some sort of a, a thinking about what's what's coming up, and. Uh, the three takeaway, I would say, um, about this webinar will be the first, how the NFT and blockchain technology are changing the art world, um, almost inside out, uh, allowing for some sort of a, what someone said, the democratization of the art world. Some of them are kind of a counter arguing with something else, but it's an important discussion. The second takeaway will be how NFT allow for new ways for audiences to participate and enjoy uh, in art and, and visual culture. And, uh, and the third takeaway will be how uh, museums and cultural institutions are really kind of uh, um, engage uh, uh, through this engagement are truly expand their, their missions almost and their sustainability alike. 
So um, I will pass the word to Aurunda for the introduction of the of the theme and and the speakers, and then we kick off with the conversation. Thank you. Aurunda, I think you're on mute. Okay. Yes. Sorry. Uh, thank you, everyone. And uh, today we are hosting people that play a significant role in Web3 transition. And I would like quickly to introduce uh, uh, Francis Lidl, uh, Diane Drublet, and uh, Florencia Brook. Uh, for first, um, I would like to introduce Francis. Uh, she is a researcher, writer, advisor, and lecturer working with the intersection of museum practice and Web3 technology. Uh, her PhD research was one of the first piece of empirical research done on museum theory on the NFT. In partnership with the National Museum Liverpool, it explores how these technologies may challenge and understanding the ownership, authority, authenticity, and social value. So, uh, hello, Francis. Um, the first question for you is, uh, can you synthesize the main bullet point of your personal research about NFT and museum? Yeah, sure. Um, thank you for that introduction. And hello, everyone. Um, it's lovely to e meet you all. Um, yeah, so as Aranda mentioned, I'm a researcher um, and lecturer and, and writer working at the intersection of this very strange emerging field known as museum practice and Web3. Um, so this all kind of started with my PhD research, which um, started in 2018. Uh, and this was a collaborative doctoral award with Nef uh, National Museums Liverpool or NML, which I'm sure many of you will be familiar with. Um, and uh, it was a kind of piece of research that was really thinking about how do we use blockchain technology outside of the monetary context? Um, so we were really thinking about this notion of ownership um, and authenticity and authority um, and thinking about the way this technology might kind of challenge our thinking around these ideas and particularly kind of museum practice and theory. Um, so with that, we worked with a group of participants to co-produce an online exhibition called Crypto Connections, uh, which is still available online. Um, I can send a link in the chat. Um, and in that is actually, you'll see it's not anything really to do with blockchain. It's actually really about our personal relationships to objects um, and alongside uh, a selection of museum objects and a selection of personal possessions is the personal experience of one of those, uh, of a participant to that particular object. Um, the blockchain element came in during a second workshop that we did with them, where we basically minted NFTs of each of these objects and gave them out to the participants. And in doing so, we were thinking about how does this create this idea of a kind of digital tether or a sense of connection between an institution and that participant, um, but also bringing those ideas of kind of storytelling and bringing in that idea of shared curatorial authority into the mix as well. Um, and with that, we kind of found a couple of different things. Um, first of which, of course, was the idea of the, this digital token being almost like a memory token. So the idea it kind of memorializes participation in some way and offers kind of insight and meaning in that way. Secondly, we found this idea of kind of shared guardianship and the way in which actually how, because the NFT, um, which I should say is a kind of type of digital asset stored on blockchain, um, of course, has this kind of real financialized element of it. We found that actually many participants didn't want to sell their token because of the personal nature to it, but also because it represented the process of doing the project in the first place. Um, and I found that really interesting because I think it brings up this idea of kind of shared duty of care and actually the way in which there is this kind of glimmer of light in the way in which this token could be a way to build relationships with particular community members. Um, but then, of course, there's this real issue of kind of what does the token really mean? And certainly there's this kind of issue of tokenism where actually the NFT is literally just a symbolic gesture and nothing else. Um, and certainly it's these three ideas that have really kind of um, I've been thinking about a lot since I finished my PhD last year. 
um, and has been starting to form what I now call dreaming of a distributed museum, which is kind of what my current research is all about. Um, and this is kind of thinking about, I suppose, on a theoretical level, the kind of museum ethics of kind of engaging in distributed technologies, but also this question of like co-productive work aims to decentralize the museum. But what does that really mean? And what can smart contracts offer in terms of creating dynamic forms of ownership? Um, so I'm really looking forward to kind of digging my teeth into this uh, kind of research question. Um, and of course, looking at ways this could be implemented in practice as well. Thank you, uh, Fran. Sorry, can, can I ask you a follow-up question, Francis. The the idea, obviously, you focus very much on beyond the idea of fundraising for our cultural institutions. That at the moment is how NFT are used for the majority of those few museums, let's say, that engage with NFT is mainly on a fundraising or exercise in terms of a benefit gala with an NFT sell or, or uh, NFT donated by an artist or a corporation and, and then put for auction and something like that. Can you expand a bit on this idea of the distributing museum through the NFT and the blockchain? Um, just briefly, I know it's a, your current research question, so you probably don't want to <laughs> divulge too much, but I think it would be kind of an interesting take to reflect on. Yeah, certainly. And I should also say caveat to that is that so I'm, I do working as a consultant within the space as well. And in particular, I'm working with Iconic Moments, an NFT platform that is specifically looking at fundraising. So um, whilst I have this kind of area, I'm also kind of very wary that this is the main focus for many museums. And I recognize the kind of importance of kind of diversifying income streams at the moment and the way that NFTs could be an interesting area in that. But putting that aside, um, the kind of work around the distributed museum, I suppose, is really thinking about, again, kind of building on this idea of kind of, so I kind of draw the idea, first of all, from community engagement models. So, of course, we have things like the participatory museum, the contributory museum, and all these terms that I kind of define, like, what does it mean when we sort of work with people outside of the museum and bring them in? And the distributed, the distributed museum, if I can say it properly, is about this idea of how value flows in and beyond the institution and actually sees the museum not as the central focus, but actually this node of a kind of wider network. Um, and where like the idea of distributed as opposed to decentralization is crucial here as well. Decentralization is the process of decentering the, fo the central focus group but it doesn't necessarily mean there's shared agency. And in fact, quite often the fringes of the network are still heavily reliant on a singular node. Whereas in the distributed network, agency is completely shared and information is easily transferable from node to node. And this is ultimately what kind of this idea of the distributed museum is trying to achieve. It's not thinking, okay, let's just decenter a little bit. Let's kind of take a completely radical idea. Um, and one idea that I've just been finishing in a paper is the idea, for example, of a smart donation box. Um, so working again in the idea of a kind of co-produced exhibition, it's this idea of like, if you are financially remunerating participants, how do you do it? You know, there's an ethical question, but it's also the financial issue of budgets. And actually donation boxes, if you inserted them, for example, with smart contracts, where the smart contract can be, um, you can have multiple wallets assigned to it meaning like, say someone inserted and donated 10 pounds, you then distribute that automatically to the different stakeholders, whoever those stakeholders might be. So that could be, for example, specific charities who are gonna support the groups who have engaged in that, group, in that um, exhibition. So thereby the value, whilst is being inserted into the museum, has been immediately transferred back out into the community. And I think that's a really interesting area and particularly one um, that, yeah, I think is, really quite radical in its approach and what kind of kind of yeah hopefully challenges museum practice a little bit more thank you um, um maybe it's good to take a step back actually just for for those not overly familiar with the idea of nft itself i, I just realized actually that what we mean by nft it's it's basically bits of code providing um, a sort of a unique ID to a digital artifact, such as that it can be distinguished from other 
potentially infinite duplicate version and and this string of codes makes possible the automation the automation of resale payments or payments to participants for instance and uh, sales sales sort of a parameter so you can split the income in different ways and uh, and and other new features just to give a, a, a bit of a, of a an overview about technically what we mean by by an nft um I, i'm i'm curious about this idea of the of the difference between distributed and 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 decentralized and as a distributor sort of so completely where the agency is completely shared for a, a museum point of view it's 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 kind of a challenging because it's uh it's not only about uh controlling the 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 input and the output but it's also about how do you make sure that kind of a the whole thing makes sense actually for that institution missions and for the for the other participants who are not really engaging with nft for instance mm -hmm. so i was wondering do you have any suggestion in terms of best practice to use nft for a museum or a cultural institution in relation to their program you mentioned for instance the smart donation box which is an interesting thing do you have other kind of a examples as best practices because I, I realize i mean coming from an institutional point of view some of these things are quite tricky to implement because you 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 kind of a you know you lose control to a certain extent which is a good thing is also a risky thing and yeah uh, and certainly it's not also like it's kind of that assumption that we have that we're like we must decentralize the museum at all times and actually that in itself in the practice is incredibly as you say incredibly difficult to achieve which is why I suppose that the research question is almost like dreaming of a distributed museum because it's quite that question of like is this where we go um but certainly I think um another really interesting area and so um I've just started a fellowship with the Arts and Antiquities Blockchain Consortium, or the AABC, which is also doing some really interesting work in this area, which again is kind of using the financialization of NFTs, but it's really about ownership models. And in particular, they proposed a really interesting theory where um, you use smart contracts, so which I mentioned, and I should explain, smart contracts are kind of the way you manage NFTs. Um, so they're most well known for, for the fact that you can input resale rights into a token so that then artists can gain secondary sales um, or a percentage of the secondary sales. Um, but you can use them in lots of different ways. And as I mentioned earlier, you can put like multiple wallets into a smart contract so multiple people can earn from a particular sale, for example. Um, but what they have been proposing in the context of a particular artifact dispute is the separation of ownership rights with smart contracts, where you actually separate exhibition rights to the formal ownership. Um, and the particular case they talk about is one where um, actually the agreement came out before um, and it, I can't remember which, I think it was between a uh, work that was originally uh, stolen in Cyprus and then was part of the DeMille collection. Um, and basically what they discussed was the idea of if the physical object was on loan and remain, remained in the collection but not exhibited, the funds uh, raised from exhibiting the work could be divided and distributed and returned back to the source community. And it's this interesting logic about this idea of repatriation, but in a way that is kind of, again, quite radical, and again, wouldn't necessarily fit with every single like opportunity. It's certainly not necessarily a framework because of the kind of nuance to the discussion. But I think it offers a really in interesting insight into the way that you could distribute um, and kind of rethink like what does ownership really mean? And actually, where does the value come from in the context of ownership? And how might that be a way to remunerate people that need to be remunerated, remunerated in a particular discussion or dispute? Thanks. Um, do you have any, um, I was wondering, maybe kind of a, a selfish, do you have any particular tips for, for institutional leaders or directors when approaching the, the, say, the NFT and the crypto world and the blockchain technology um, with their team, for instance? Because, you know, we can assume that within a cultural institution, there are some people who are actually 
knowledgeable about the technology and the different approaches to the technology and what they can do, not necessarily actually the, the, the leadership sort of the senior management team. And I was wondering if you're in your experience, you have any tips for them to kind of <laughs> open up? Yeah. This? yeah, definitely. I mean, you know, it's a difficult one. Um, I think certainly in my experience and kind of speaking with various museums in the last few years, it tends to fall to like the commercial side of the institution. And I think perhaps that's a bit of a narrow minded idea. Um, and it kind of comes back to that th moment we were sort of saying earlier about this issue of like the, the sole focus seems to be about fundraising, which is good and it's interesting. But then people seem to kind of think, well, then NFTs belong in the gift shop and it's the commercial side. When actually, I think if you incorporated like the educational department or, you know, curators or, you know, the kind of anyone in terms of like, I think it's kind of a cross de uh, departmental idea. Um, I actually think you'd come up with much more innovative ideas and actually something that would be much more supportive of the current work you're doing. Um, because certainly I think people kind of think a lot of the like, how do we put NFTs into museums? But actually NFTs should just be kind of one of many tools to our of availability in the same way that like you might have an app, for example, which you might use to kind of encourage people to explore a museum. Well, you know, you could then be thinking about, well, actually, you could layer NFTs into that app. So I suppose what I'm trying to get at is perhaps it's thinking not necessarily about what you do with the NFT, but actually think about what you're currently doing across your whole institution and the way that could then bring collaborations or enhance the visitor experience, for example. So in a way, it will be how you expand what you're already doing through yeah, the blockchain so. and nft not just to you know reinvent or replace what you're doing which is exactly, i think is, that's is, the hardest bit i think you know yeah i think it's like, a, oh, like, is, where do we go yeah, yeah <laughs> it's an important message to deliver here actually that you know, we don't have to kind of uh, you know replace on on uh, or start a new from a sort of a um tabula rasa what we're doing because there is the blockchain technology we just think about what we're already doing what are the our core values and missions and 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 strategies if you want and and try to understand how we can expand it through this technology somehow exactly yeah okay um how do you think how do you envision actually the the future of this technology in relation to let's say i don't know museums agenda are very varied in a way you know we have a definition of museum which is accepted by the icon and da, da, da. But in a nutshell, what is your gut feeling about how it will it will it will progress? Um, it's interesting. Like I still find it quite amazing that the sector is so interested in the technology, and it's be purely because you know uh, you know certainly again coming from kind of the museum side of it is that we're incredibly risk averse, <laughs> and then yeah. it's the most experimental technology that you can think of right now, and everyone seems to, seems to suddenly want to engage with it. Um, so, you know, where do we go from here? I mean, I hope the enthusiasm still continues. And then certainly I think it's like that need to be fearless and to experiment in some way. Um, but actually, I was just on a talk uh, last night and actually one of my fellow panelists made a really great point about the problem right now with blockchain and Web3 is that there's still these kind of issues of the onboarding process and the nature of like, even though it's very easy to set up a digital wallet, there is this still a thing you have to transfer between crypto and fiat. And, you know, there's a kind of layer of like slight complexity that is enough unknown to enough people that they're not going to actually want to engage with it. And actually the point where this is going to change and the point where I think it really will infiltrate museums is when that becomes invisible and where people don't necessarily need to think about blockchain in order to engage with it in the same way that like, I expect most people or half people on this call might not know how the actual internet works, like the different layers of the protocol, because you don't need to know in order to like go onto a Zoom call. In the same way, like I think blockchain and NFTs, that's where it will probably hit mainstream in terms of museums is this point where you don't need to be explaining what an NFT is or what blockchain is. People just 
it's sort of like, oh, look, that's a nobility of Minton. You know, and I think that's a really interesting. I don't whether that will happen in 2023. I feel like that's probably unlikely, but certainly I feel like in the next few years, um, it's going to be interesting to see that transition finally happen. Yeah, it reminds me that there was, I can't remember the author now, the, the, there was a small booklet, a white paper many years ago about the law of simplicity, and it was 10 laws of simplicity. And one of the fundamental ones is like making complexity disappear. So, kind of a mm -hmm. Uh, and that's true for emails, I mean, or for text yeah. messages, you know, nobody really, I mean, I don't for sure understand actually how the protocol actually work specifically in technical details. I just use text or emails or, or charts. So, mm -hmm. okay, super. Thanks a lot. Um, uh, Francis, I have a last one question for you. Yeah. <laughs> um, I know that you work for an uh, iconic moment, there is a Web3 platform dedicated to culture and the heritage institution. I would like to know how it works. How it works. Um, so, yeah, so a lot of that is, is still kind of just being launched at the moment. Um, but yeah, it's focusing primarily on fundraising. Um, and there's a couple of different strands to it, but one project that I'm really looking forward to um, for it to be launched in, in March is our work with the Women's Suffrage Monument, uh, which for those of you who don't know, there is less than 5% of monuments in the US are dedicated to women. And in 2020, they had their centenary. So they managed to get um, a sort of uh, a bill through to get this monument made in Washington. But of course, um, need to find a way to fundraise for it. So we are producing an NFT project uh, which combines lots of different elements of the suffrage movement called Modern Rebels. And it's about kind of engaging people with the history again, but also finding a way for like the main thing is like it's fundraising and the NFT just so happens to be kind of part of that as well. And I think that is a really interesting kind of if you're kind of going into the think about kind of the ways of like building relationship fundraising, for example, and the way this could potentially build a community of uh, patrons for that monument, who they can then rely on time and time again, um, I think is quite an innovative and exciting idea if you're kind of thinking about the kind of financialization of NFTs. Thank you. So uh, now we are going to introduce Diane Drubre. Hello, Diane. Hi, Aranda. Hi, hi. Everyone. hi. Uh, Diane is another iconic woman in Web3. Uh, she is head of art and culture for Tezos Connect, which is the Bernie entity of Tezos Foundation, where uh, Diane uh, facilitated collaboration and lead strategy about uh, Web3 future prototype across art and culture. The purpose is to promotion of the Tezos protocol through grants and other capital development vehicles. Uh, Diane has been working toward the transformation of museum and the art internationally since 20, uh, 2007. And she found uh, We Are Museum, a community power think tank of the future of museum that are good for people and planet. And Diane is also a visual artist nudging for nature awareness and better future. So welcome to be here. You are very welcome. And um, we are going to ask you the first question uh, that is uh, um, about, uh, we would like to know about your experience about WYAC Lab and the fellowship program in relation to museum. Thanks, Aranda, and um, thanks, Alfredo, for inviting me here. Um, so yeah, um, I'm actually having two different hats. Uh, one is really focusing on the art and culture for Tezos. I'm co-leading the art vertical um, for the Tezos Foundation. And I'm also the founder of We Are Museums, which is, as Aranda explained, this um, international network of museum uh, change makers. And we actually combine both to create WAC, Web3 for the Art and Culture, which is actually um, multi-month program in, in three different phases. Um, one is called the Work Weekly. So we actually meet every Wednesday at 5 p.m. Um, uh, UTC. Um, so it's, it's every Wednesday. <laughs> and we talk about the latest news uh, in Web3 blockchain um, for museums. 
um, they feel free to join us. We also have a medium uh, where we publish the summaries of all our discussions. So the goal is really to create this space for people to, to share um, what they think about the, the latest news in Wall Street and museums, but also to share insights and knowledge. So it's really a really supportive and open, open space for discussion. And then we have um, the WAC Fellowship. Uh, it's actually a 16 or 12 weeks program. Um, training museum professionals and cultural institutions professional um, into Web3 and blockchain technology, helping them understand how to use uh, this new technology for their own needs. Um, and then the fellowship actually ends with a four weeks program, which is called the WAC Factory, where we basically match all the different institutions with a tech integrator who is already um, experienced in blockchain technology for the arts and then they prototype something. So the main goal of this WAC lab, this WAC program is really to um, create a network, create a supportive network because we have to say it, it's quite, quite messy. <laughs> it's difficult to understand what's happening. It's difficult to understand what is good, what is not. So just trying to guide, um, to guide everyone and, and just share. Um, but it's also a way to help, um, to help us, uh, museum professionals and blockchain professionals, identify how this technology can be used by the art and culture and maybe find new use case as well. And showing that it's all about experimenting. We are still at the beginning of everything, as um, Frances explained. We are experimenting, testing different things, researching different things. Um, and trying to figure out how to best use this technology uh, to create yeah, some lasting impact. So um, that is a yeah, big laboratory. <laughs> we are actually launching tomorrow um, the second co cohort of, um, of the fellowship with 12 beautiful institutions. And um, what I would like maybe to say that the first uh, cohort, which happened last year, um, helped us create something quite beautiful that I want to share uh, in the chat, if it's possible. We actually collaborated with the Light Art Space Foundation and the artist Yan Cheng. And you will see within this, um, this video that we fully integrated the NFT process, the NFT mechanism inside of the visitor journey and inside of the concept, the artistic concept of the artist. So, you know, as you said, Frances, we are not really talking about blockchain here. We are not really talking about NFTs. People don't really know actually what they did, <laughs> but 4,500 people did it um, within the, the period of the two months of exhibition. And, you know, it was painless. It was, you know, just about adding some info on an iPad and then receiving this paper with them and then scanning, um, having to click a few times on your mobile phone and then you receive this memory. So it's very similar to what you did, Frances, a few years back. Um, it's really about having this memory of your of your experience, having, but also having this personalized memory of the of of your um, visit. So what we did with Yan Cheng was actually live minting and generative art at the same time. Um, yeah, I just wanted to share it because I think it's a beautiful success, and yeah, it's, it was um what we did during the one of the projects that we did during the first cohort of the fellowship <laughs> amazing diane thanks a lot actually for sharing the the instagram uh, clip as well because i knew i knew the project because actually it was presented at art basel uh, on the panel i didn't know actually it was coming from the wac fellowship that's i, I missed that bit of information um just because it's full of uh, institution, this this room here, can you share us? Uh, is it kind of an annual fellowship? Do you have an annual deadline to apply with, or is mm -hmm. just ongoing basis? How does it work practically so, speaking? Yeah. So last year we've done one time. We've done it one time um, because you know it was also the first time we yeah. learned so much. Um, so this year we will actually have two cohorts. Um, so one beginning of the year and the second one in September um, and because it's quite quite long you know it's 12 weeks of yeah. um, training but also mentoring we have amazing mentors 
um, uh, but also ideating and, and starting to prototype. And then we have a work factory at the end. Yeah, so we do it two times a year. Um, and and there is a deadline for the application, which is available online, I guess, for, for cultural institutions and museums who wants to explore a bit more this possibility. Yeah, we will update it uh, for September, but for the okay. first cohort, um, it's passed. It yeah. was uh, in December. Um, and yeah, during the first this cohort, we will actually have the, um, the ACME in Australia joining the Belvedere Museum, the, the EC in Zurich, the French Ministry of Culture, the Musée d'Orsay, um, the Royal College of Art. So it's a it's a list of yeah, beautiful beautiful institutions yeah. ready to to be embodied, um, but also with a wish to learn, um, and that's something that is very important as well for us. It's feeling that the institutions are actually willing uh, of the need to learn and be guided um, because we have yeah, just long list of mentors and trainers um, uh, at their disposal so yeah um, it's but, important yeah, that you quite a also, commitment yeah i guess so. and also it's important that you basically share what you learn during the first or the second fellowship with the with the one actually coming afterwards so you don't sort of repeat certain mistakes and you 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 kind of a sort of a streamline let's say uh, as much as possible their ideas to to complete to successful completion and i'm sure in autumn it will be mm. even better yeah yeah <laughs> i'm sure too yeah. I'm, ex I'm excited <laughs> okay good um uh just follow up actually you um, we, we we got a grasp of about the uh, wac lab and fellowship um could you tell us a bit more about uh tezos how Tezos collaborate with museums and galleries uh, like the Serpentine, for instance, in London or the Next Museum in, in Amsterdam or the Van Gogh Museum and how somehow Tezos helped this, I, I wouldn't call it transition, but almost like an expansion of their, their, their practice, their, their activities. Well, um, the Tezos Foundation and the Tezos Ecosystem at large is really here to support um, and to and, and we are at the stage of we are at a stage of experimentation. So, if for instance we are, we got, we started to get in touch with the Serpentine team, and they really wanted to experiment with how to integrate blockchain technology within video games. So we are actually partnering with them to work on their upcoming um, exhibition with Gabriel Massan. And you know, it's it's really like a small laboratory. It's really about trying to figure out how to, to, to connect these two technologies and you know, adding on top contemporary art um, and, and, and such institutions as the Serpentine and yeah, trying to, uh, to make sense of everything and to collaborate. So exactly as we did with the Light Art Space Foundation, um, we have um, Tezos, uh, the institution and the artists. And then we actually have these three teams working together and collaborating together um, to achieve, um, to yeah, to take this to, to take this challenge <laughs> because that's a challenge. Um, exactly like with Yan Cheng, it was a challenge, and and the teams collaborated with with Brio, um, and we hope to do the same with the Serpentine. <laughs> But yeah, just to answer your question, it's really about supporting, um, and it's really about um, yeah, experimenting, trying different things. Um, of course, using the the Tezos blockchain in different ways uh, is something that we but that we love to do. NFTs are, are one thing. Um, PFPs are, are NFT based art, uh, but we can do so much more. And that's also something that we exper we experiment um, with the WAC lab, trying to really identify new ways of using yeah. this technology. Is it the WAC lab um, working functioning as a as a as a filter for all the approaches you have from institution, or are that, or could the institution actually uh, approach you and Tezos um, without being part of the WAC lab? It's totally possible to approach uh, the Tezos Foundation or any Tezos entity different, like outside of the WAC lab. I would say that WAC is a really safe and and um, and benevolent environment and very yeah, supportive environment for museum professionals to grow. And it's 
it looks like an accelerator program mm. um, with the other, like outside of this, of this program, we will maybe take more time. It will be also maybe more bespoke as well, maybe more challenging. Um, so, you know, you have yeah, two different um, ways to, to start innovating. Uh, first one, you, you learn and you, you apply. So you do it very fast. Or second, you really take your time, you iterate, and then you have a, yeah, you, you hope to, <laughs> yeah. to challenge yourself at the end. Yeah. And you mentioned earlier that, for instance, Ian Cheng, um, it, it wasn't really about the NFT as such. It was more about the viewer experience, really, the, the, almost the, the viewer journey through the museum. Yeah. And um, if, we, if we go back to the, let's say, pure NFT sort of a, a format, or how do you think, I mean, also building on what Francis was um, mentioning earlier, how does NFT can help museum delivering their objective, for instance, in, in your view? In so many ways. <laughs> like, Just a few examples. <laughs> well, I can, I can list uh, plenty. Um, but yeah, definitely NFTs to sell digital art is, is a fabulous way to, to sell, but also to get some royalties for artists, but also curators, museums, and other um, art players. It's uh, also a way to uh, create new type of artworks. Uh, you know, we are talking a lot about on-chain generative arts, or on-chain data-driven arts, and this can be applied to museums. And then we will mostly talk about live minting. We will talk about proof of attendance. We will talk about NFT giveaway. Um, so that's one thing which could actually lead to an, um, um, community building and new types of public, public engagement. Um, and this could also lead afterwards to, um, you know, so many kinds of token gated um, services of our products, our program, our spaces, which could lead to potential DAOs. Um, you know, it could lead to DAO powered museum programmation. It could lead to um, DAO powered shared art collection between institutions. It could lead to so many things. Um, of course, uh, like as Frances was mentioning, with iconic moment, it could lead to fundraising. That's also one thing. Mm -hmm. But we could also use NFTs as ticket, you know, NFT ticketing, um, and this could be also, um, as I said before, about these token gated um, services or program. So many things. <laughs> no, no, it's, it's just it's just to give an example. There's so many sort of, of um, strands that this technology can apply to, which is, you know, I, I just wanted to hear from you actually that you <laughs> give concrete examples. Actually, can, can you just expand on the on the, the you mentioned the DAO just for those of in this room that are not familiar with what is a DAO? So a DAO is a decentralized autonomous organization. You can see it as a co-op you know cooperative but on chain yeah. <laughs> um so it's really a group of people having the same ambition and intention and joining forces or joining funds or joining um resources to achieve their the needs and then so, voting on what is the direction that this collective so collectivity let's say would 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 take in terms of actions and deliveries and strategies etc yeah I, I just wanted to you know mention actually for everyone so they, they obviously there are more, much more detail on that actually but i think it's, it's good to just give an, an impression um uh Aurunde, any question from you oh yes uh, uh, i'm really curious about uh, how tezos built the collection with miss and harriman because yeah if you tell us uh, more about uh, the, this the, collaboration. The, yeah. Who's the chair of the South Bank Center? Yeah. Yeah. Sure. Um, so, Ms. Sanaiman, as you just said, um, is the chairman of the, of the South Bank Center, but he is also a photographer and an activist. And the Tesla Foundation thought it was beautiful to um, give him access to 1.2 million dollars so he could start building up the collection of the Tezos Foundation. And because of we and because of, of his perspective on, on art and on things and on society, his mission was really to support artists from Africa and Asia. Um, so for us it was a beautiful way to you know create a, a very strong permanent art collection. Um, first first of the kind 
um, but also being, being, being able to support talents from country often uh, under, underrepresented in the NFT space and in the traditional art space. And like this was totally not planned, but what happened is that Nissan started to see his, um, his role as a patron. So he will actually see himself as an art collector, not so much as an art collector, but more as a patron. So he was really collecting from artists to support them and to help them thrive. Um, and it was so beautiful to see, like if you checked on Twitter, you could see some artists almost crying because just by buying a few NFTs from them, um, they, this totally changed their life. Um, so I think it's something really, um, it's, a, it's a quite a game changer uh, with this NFT art space is that you collect to support, you collect to be part of a community, you collect to express um, that, you, that, you, that you want to, con to be connected to an artist. And the role of a collector is much more important and essential than like in, in the NFT art space than the um, traditional art space, I would say, because you have direct um, connection and direct interaction between the artist and the collectors. And yeah, it's creating this beautiful network, very, again, very supportive network. Um, so that's, um, that's what happened. <laughs> yeah. It's worth to mention, uh, perhaps, that in the in the NFT art space, um, the first group of collectors of any artist uh, releasing or, or uh, a work is actually other artists. Um, so the, the most of the artists they start actually to um, to to release NFTs, and then their the peer actually. Um, network are, are buying that artist. So the, there is this kind of a mutual support, uh, which is uh, uh, which is extremely uh, important and, and very interesting because it's, it's kind of a, again, we're talking about a lot about crypto art, sort of a, um, somehow uh, challenging the established structure of the art system in terms of the gatekeeping. So you, you do have, you know, the art school and the artist studio and the artist front space and the artist gallery and then the artist institution and then the artist collector and da da da. And in, in, in the world of digital art and especially crypto NFT using the blockchain technology, this one is, is much more kind of a blurred and mixed because um, a lot of, of uh, NFT collectors are actually artists themselves. Um, and then from then it kind of a spiral up, let's say, or, or out to, to reach uh, collectors who are not artists, who are actually just supporting the, the work of artists. And then from there, actually the institutional sort of a circle, if you want. Um, but I think it's an important uh, element to, to keep in mind because it's, it's, it's clearly what makes uh, the, this expansion of the contemporary world so interesting because it's, uh, it's, uh, it, it kind of a provide um, an access to uh, peer network and validations and support and, and possibility to make a living, which wasn't there before in a way, or it was there before, but in a much, much more rarefied and, and, and difficult way. Um, I, I think it's important to kind of a point to this one because it's one of the main things. Um, sorry, I just interrupted. <laughs> Thank you so much. It's, um, yeah, it's, you, you said it beautifully and it's, uh, I, I can't agree more. <laughs> Definitely. Um, Aronda, do you have any other questions? From yeah, your... I have a, another right. curiosity uh, about Tezos and our Basel, because Tezos was the first mm. boot ever in an art fair fair then i would like to know more about this experience it was a beautiful experience <laughs> um <laughs> we know we know <laughs> and it really really changed a lot in the nft and the blockchain scene and and the and the art market the traditional art market we really um, for the first time, we could actually see, uh, you know, a blockchain exhibiting NFT-based artworks, um, or blockchain-based artworks in a traditional art fair. Um, so, yeah, the first time it was in Miami, 2021. 
it was mind blowing. Everyone, you know, couldn't really understood, couldn't really understand what it was, but it it, it really stayed in in people's memory. And then um, we've done it again a few months after in um, Hong Kong. Um, beautiful outreach as well. A beautiful feedback from. Um, from the visitors and the galleries. And then we've done it again at uh, Basel in, in Switzerland. And then again <laughs> at Paris Plus in, 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 um, in Paris. And then um, to finalize the, the circle at Miami last December in 2022. And for us, it was really a way to show that we are talking about art. Um, new art players are actually coming in the traditional art market. Um, you know, we just talked about the new type of collectors, uh, marketplaces are also sometimes playing the role of galleries, our agents. Um, it was a way really to show that um, this is coming. Um, and I think it was also giving this, this window uh, open toward the future. Um, so it created a lot of, lot of curiosity. And what, what was really beautiful in Paris Plus in October is that people so the Tezos logo multiple times and they were not questioning it anymore. They were actually ready to, to embrace it and open wallets and starting to collect. So it was really beautiful because in, in Paris Plus and in Miami, you could actually collect an open wallet on site. So directly in on our booth. Um, and finally, people can understand also uh, the technology behind and see that it was not so difficult. Um, so after one year, um, this experiment was a huge success and we really saw people's um, mindset change and evolve through the different editions. So, um, and also good to notice, uh, good to, um, to add the fact that we've done that in collaboration with FXH, which is the generative art platform on, on the Tezos blockchain. So we were also introducing generative, generative art um, to Art Basel audience, which was also um, quite quite interesting. <laughs> but I would be curious to hear about your your point of view on on our booth, uh, because we met in Paris Plus. Maybe you saw other ones. Uh, what are your thoughts about it? Uh, yeah, then uh, uh, I remember your booth for the beginning. When uh, no one was able to mint an NFT or to collect an NFT with a wallet, and now recently, um, a Paris Plus, there was really a lot of people. There was really knowledgeable, and uh, they everyone know now what is an NFT, and uh, they accept the boot like a, a stable things in the art world. And uh, now there are these new trends that all the art fair want to have uh, a boot about the uh, NFT. Or, or a pavilion of the digital pavilion, a pavilion like the, yeah, the next yeah. art Dubai and the previous one. Yeah, yeah for yeah, me also yeah. it, was, it was interesting because it was a combination between some sort of a technology introduction at the beginning, but just delivering. So the, the live minting and, uh, and uh, I, I think, and also, you know, the FX Ash actually, the guys, they were there, they were really, really helpful, really handy to kind of go through things if one got stuck and then it was really easy somehow. But also you had the presentation of of digital arts actually from, you know, kind of a, um, Herbert Frank to, to other actually major pioneers and, and current practitioners. That also gave some sort of an idea that um what we are talking about here actually in terms of digital art is 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 it didn't kind of a start out of a vacuum in 2019 <laughs> it started actually with mathematical patterns art actually in the 50s and the 60s and it's just an evolution of 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 technology uh, uh applied to art and you know kind of a arts and applied technology somehow and uh, and this i think is an important element that it has to be part of you know kind of a um an event like an art fair or or, or a biennial or or a, a big international symposium because it's many artists are working with these tools actually nowadays yeah thank you thank you for um for um, uh, commenting on, on on what we did in art basel in basel uh it was so beautiful to have a piece from albert Franke. 
um, and I feel always grateful to Annika Mayer who actually facilitated this uh, this introduction and having having his piece in front of the new generation yeah. created this beautiful mm -hmm. dialogue showing that yeah it is already part of history we are not inventing something it's just as you said beautifully it's just the evolution of it good um around the carry shall we have five minutes break and then we go with florencia and uh, yeah. and uh, and the q a is that okay yeah. That would be great. Yeah. So if everyone could come back at two minutes past uh, four in UK time, that'd be great. So if you just want to switch your cameras off for a couple of minutes yeah. and have a quick comfort break. We, we are amazingly we'll on time, guys. It's, we I are know. even three <laughs> minutes earlier. <laughs> <laughs> just right. Thanks, everyone. Thank you. Okay, welcome back, everyone. Um, Alfredo, I'll hand over to you then, and we can get started uh, from our next lovely speaker. You're muted. <laughs> Still, after three years of pandemic, I mean, my <laughs> on, 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 on by default. Um, sorry, Aurunda, are you happy actually to introduce Florencia and uh, yeah, as, yeah, uh, and the last, uh, the last speaker? Welcome, Florencia. Uh, Florencia is uh, an, Argen uh, an Argentine artist and entrepreneur raised between my uh, Milan and Buenos Aires. She moved in uh, Washington in 1996 and worked with the main uh, company like Mediaset, yeah. Microsoft, uh, the World Bank, uh, International Finance Corporation. But the most important thing is that Florencia is the founder of the Central Art Pavilion, the first major NFT exhibition during the Venice Art Biennale 2022 future over 1,400 NFT artwork by 87 lead international artists shaping the NFT space, including Beeple, Peter Pasma, uh, Hakazao, Snowfron, and Xcopy, among other ones. Hi, so, hello, everyone. <laughs> hi, hi. So, uh, of course, we would like to know uh, what does the idea of the, the Central Art Pavilion come up in your mind and we would like to know more about the story. Sure. Hi. Hello. Thank you for having me. Um, okay. So um, everything started because, um, um, as you know, I'm a, a, a programmer and also an artist and uh, the blockchain and the NFT was like the perfect uh, combination um, for me to dive in and, and and um, and kind of uh, put all my expertise in in one place. I uh, participated in two biennales before um, uh, creating the Central Pavilion, so I knew um, a lot about Venice and how things worked over there. And um, I was going to participate uh, as an artist also in the last biennale and um, with everything that was happening with the NFT uh, with the you know, we, our team um, in Milan, we all decided why instead of going uh, ourselves, why don't we just bring as many artists as we can? And uh, I think it's a, it was a great opportunity and a great place to, to, um, to talk about, to open the dialogue, because at the moment, um, nobody really knew. Uh, it, was, it was new now, you know, you talk about NFT, blockchain, and it's kind of, uh, uh, um, more common ground, but when we decided to 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 open the pavilion uh, at the Biennale, it was um, uh, like completely new, and uh, I think it was unexpected because nobody in uh, any of the pavilions was actually uh, thinking about creating an a, an NFT uh, section. Uh, so yeah, we wanted to be there. We thought it was a great opportunity, and. Um, and we uh, reach uh, several um, sponsors and a uh, big uh, players uh, in the NFT, uh, like uh, Super Rare and Arab Blocks, and they supported the idea. And we talked with um, artists, uh, big artists, uh, as you mentioned before, and they were all on board. And uh, it really came out as, as a community. And we all decided uh, to say, okay, let's, let's do this. It wasn't easy because we did everything in like four months uh, from uh, scouting the location, 
um, all the permits. Uh, it, it was really like a, like a lot a lot of work and many artists. So, yeah. <laughs> We know, we know. Yeah, because we were we were there with you. <laughs> no, especially the you know the responsibility of having to create um, something that was not just let's put some monitors and let's uh, display the digital artwork, but we really thought about um, how to bring. I think I think was one of the you know the biggest compliments we got from the from the pavilion was how we showcased. Uh, the artworks because we created uh, a, a museology for the exhibition because we knew in um, in um, the Biennale uh, how things were showcases showcased so um, we created this concept of uh, of a tree um, where everything gets connected and you you couldn't see basically the uh, the cables that's why we wanted really. Uh, to come across, we didn't want just to be like a place with monitors and looks like a sales store. But we said no, let's let's mm. like th what the NFT world uh, needed at that time was let's showcase this as art pieces. So we hide um, we hide all the um, all the cables inside of this metal structure, and the um, and because we were in a palazzo, all the frescoes were there. We couldn't in some of the rooms we couldn't even attach the uh, the monitors to the walls so um, this this tree of monitors um, uh, very minimalist I don't know if you um, you can go to our website there are a lot of um, pictures from the event and I think it was really nice to see the old and the new like the, the it really worked out uh, really well uh, so we were really happy with that and it um, was uh, yeah. it was it was really one of the things that that um, uh, stuck out actually of that of that pavilion because it was uh, th there was some sort of a curatorial <clears throat> expertise mm -hmm. and and, uh, mm -hmm. and and almost scholarship in in sh showing digital arts um, and that's one of the you know usual um, criticism about uh, you know uh, NFT mm -hmm. environments yeah. and galleries and things like that that you kind of enter a space and you got a series of rectangular monitors on the wall mm. and with different artworks, which is frankly boring. Uh, mm -hmm. But actually, when entering actually that that space that you uh, organized actually in Venice last 2022, no, yeah, last year, yeah, um, year. It, it was something different because you enter some sort of immersive environment where you have this kind of a tree and uh, mm -hmm. and you kind of the monitor that were actually they were in the middle of the space, but you have to go through it. It was a viewer journey mm -hmm. and a viewer experience. Um, which was really, uh, really carefully crafted, uh, I would say. Um, that that was our impression at least. <laughs> and, yeah, uh, and we also we also had like a big room. So because it, it's really uh, important not only to display the artwork in the in the in the monitors, but also to uh, display that we had like this huge um, uh, projection room, and you could see each artwork uh, in its own. In a room without uh, any other uh, uh, artworks, so it was really um, like you could contemplate and and also because it has sound. Many of the NFTs they have sound, and when you have uh, many um, artworks in one room, yeah. it's difficult to yeah to play all of them at once. Yeah. Even though you have these speakers that are very uh look you know when you get so closer yeah. to the work the tune but it's not the same so we decided to create this immersive room where you could sit down and appreciate the artworks the sound only one work artwork at the time and we had a touch screen where you could even um choose the artist and the artwork and you know decide to if you want to 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 look at a particular artist you would be able to you were able to to select it from from the digital okay. screen. Can I can I ask you one thing actually that mm -hmm. you mentioned that you 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 started as an artist yourself, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Uh, and then progressively, you know, when you were talking about the the, the central pavilion experience in Venice, you're talking about a a, collect, a collective a collectivity. So how yeah. do you? I was wondering how do you did you approach the digital and the Web three world actually from your point of view? <clears throat> mm -hmm. Not asking when. Some years ago, I guess. But how? What, what was your your kind of a approach as an artist? I guess. 
Uh, well, I was using already technology to to tackle some um, some things that I wanted to say. For example, I had a what is called a, an out of body experience. For example, when I was a child, and uh, I used technology to to express that that feeling and that experience that I had. So I was already um, doing this. I also for the last Biennale, uh, I did a work with the data visualization where we took the, uh, the data from the United Nations and, um, and created the portal to, to, to bring awareness of the situation of the refugees, for example. So for me, it was kind of, um, of um, natural when the NFT and, and the, the technology came about where I could actually certify my work, my digital work, so, uh, and also because I've been in technology since the web two, uh, my company 19 site in Washington DC was founded in 96 and we were pioneers in what was the internet. Um, in 2005, we were already doing virtual worlds for the America's Cup and, and, and downloading the data from the races and doing live uh, races in virtual worlds, for example. So uh, for me it was, when when all the, the the blockchain and I remember the nights in Clubhouse, everybody talking about. I'm very enthusiastic. Like I I think I was like an entire week without going out of my of my studio, <laughs> just uh, you know sleeping like almost falling asleep with the Clubhouse, hearing everybody. So it was crazy. It was fantastic. It was. Great. So it was kind of a natural progression for you to, to go from the individual approach as an artist to some, some form of collectivity and community building. Yes, yes, because we, we, we for, for digital artists, we found, you know, this is it. This is finally the technology that will allow us to, to redeem ourselves in the art world. And yeah. so, because before, like you said before, digital art is not something new. But it's just mm. that people didn't know how to collect it, how to uh, preserve it, how to update it. And so, yeah. Uh, one, thing I was, uh, one thing I wanted to mention, actually, mm. um, to, to the broader group here, actually, that the, the, in real life, meetups and events and gathering are super important for, mm. for digital artists and NFT mm. artists and crypto and the blockchain sort of industry. Mm. Um, maybe sort of a, uh, confusingly, but it is like that actually. You know, th there is this amazing sort of a digital technology that allows actually to to connect with each other if you want actually from our laptop and the seat. Uh, but it, it's it's somehow even more important actually for for NFT artists and and crypto art to 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 meet up actually in person and to to exchange ideas, to to networking, to to have some feedback from each other. Also because a lot of them they collect each other so this mm -hmm. this emphasis on 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 real life sort of events is is really really important and uh, and it's something that i wanted to mention actually because maybe actually not not everyone is aware about it um uh, another question actually uh, i have is is like um you the, the central pavilion recently opened a metaverse um ecosystem let's say mm -hmm and uh, and uh, and uh, for 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 the work you do for the project you stage for the collection you have and in your experience what would be the the main sort of a difference between this virtual platform and um and in real life museum or cultural institution mm -hmm. actually it serves as sustaining the 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 in real life exhibition, because we are um, between events, we keep on innovating on, on this medium. And because we also want to support anything that is new, new technology. And we want to be able to have all the available um, environments and mediums to be able to express and to allow artists to express. For example, we had um, our um, virtual world is uh, more high end than what you usually see in uh, the central land because those are very gaming and, and ours has uh, has a hyper reality uh, feel and uh, what we want to achieve is to allow artists to create artworks that are meant to be born in the in the virtual world 
specifically. So not only having what we have in real life, but to create artworks that uh, to, to give the support to artists, uh, to create artworks that they are meant to live in these environments. That couldn't exist in real life somehow. Yeah, either. also, yes. So that's why we want to have all the mediums and all the spaces possible because we want to open the doors to innovation. And how did you build this, let's say, complementary ecosystem? Um, what, what, what was the procedure actually to, to build it? What was the path, at least? Not, not, not maybe the technical details, but somehow mm -hmm. to know how you started and how you progressed it and what was the difficulties and the, mm -hmm. uh, and the you know, um, highs and lows about building it? Um... Well, you have you have many type of technologies. It's kind of um, um, it's not it's not easy yet to build uh, virtual worlds, and this is especially these types because they are based on on gaming engines like uh, Unity and uh, Unreal Engine. So it requires a lot of uh, of uh, technical uh, people to to do it. But for us, it was very important to have a, a as I as I said before, like a, a hyper reality virtual world. And something that can grow also in the future with uh, with uh, Google's and to be able to 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 jump in and have a full experience in the in the virtual world. Um, what we are what we are doing right now, um, this virtual world is a very um, low entry for everybody that doesn't know all technology. We don't ask for emails. We don't ask for login. Uh, you just go in and you start like if it was a, a website. You, you can go to decentralpavilion.io and go to Metaverse and um, everything loads really fast. It's a, it's a WebGL, so you don't need any, any to download any plugins. Um, so that's for, for us, that was very important because we don't want yeah. to have to, people to have to register, to download a, a software, to... Yeah, that, that's that's actually it's a reminder of what we were talking before about the easiness of using this technology, like you know the the the, the live minting or the digital wallet or that kind of a thing. When mm -hmm. when you when you when you use this technology, you present this technology, you, you have this kind of a um, possibility barrier. to yeah, yeah to sometimes. lower the barrier so yeah. that the complexity of it it kind of a disappear. You mm -hmm. bring in. Uh, the mass audiences because you don't think how the protocol to write an email or to send a text or, or to engage in a chat you, you just use yeah. it and that I think is is a probably a fundamental question going on um, in the future and it opens a lot of possibilities because for example uh, for the central pavilion the way we did the real, in real life exhibition is every week we will have like different themes fashion and nft uh, women and nft so also in, real, in, a, in the virtual world, the, we are planning to have the avatars dressed up with some of the fashion that artists are creating. So it's, you know, you need to have all these mediums to, for, you know, each, each artwork has a way of expressing in this digital era. One art in real life, some with projections, some are interactive. So, um, for us, it's very important also the, um, to, to give a, a consulting and support and to empower uh, everybody that wants to create new projects. And that's what we want to, uh, to, to do also for the, next, um, for the next Biennale, is to, we are, we are um, collaborating with different um, uh, brands and different galleries, and um, they are going to have um, like a week uh, where they can propose and showcase uh, their new technology. We are going to have like immersive rooms uh, and all this now through collaboration. So yeah, yeah, it's going to be fun. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Uh, Ronda, have a, uh, do you have any other questions? Yeah, maybe the last question is um, on your website, the claim mm -hmm. is decoding the uh, NFT and the future of the art. Mm -hmm. Then I would like to have your prediction about which is now the future of the art. 
Uh, how how <laughs> NFT? Yeah, how, how NFT, NFT will impact actually art? Yeah, that's a good question. Or the central art pavilion. Yeah, Your yeah, vision, yeah. like an artist and like a curator. Well, the, the is to open for new possibilities. So I think, like for example, artificial intelligence right now is going to play like a big role now in the next uh, five years. We are going to see so many things changing. So um, to the, the challenge is to, to be open, to think about this technology, to talk about it, to give support um, for this technology. And uh, because more people we involve, more companies, more, more galleries, more artists, more we talked about it, we can make good decisions for the future because that's, I think, what is most important is the dialogue around everything that we are going through is, is going really fast. Um, it's to catch up is, is not easy. And uh, the more we, we involve and we more, more we, we create this, this, um, these communities, I think together we can embrace better what's coming next. Yeah. yeah. It's, it's, if I may add, actually, it's also important to possibly highlight that nobody knows everything. Because mm. it's still a, a, a world, a space, as, as they said, which is some sort of at the beginning, and mm -hmm. uh, the, the evolution is very quick, and yeah. uh, there are new players and new actors mm -hmm. coming up at every time, and uh, some of them will fade away, some of them will come into uh, front and center. So you know, there's, there's, um, if there is any a bit of a kind of a um, cautiousness to say okay i don't know enough to engage with it i just you know my advice would be just you know forget about it just just go in just you know uh -huh. uh, dive into the space see what you can do within the limits that you have in terms of times and resources and whatever but you know kind of a, it's, it's just a process for everyone it's literally a journey for for everyone involved no matter how uh, how is your expertise in terms of digital arts and advanced technology um, I, I, that that will be my my recommendation in a way. Yeah, we created uh, also some, uh, for example, for the art night in Venice, we created um, a, a kind of tours also for people who didn't know about uh, this technology, and we made it fun and we made uh, examples of. Uh, we had uh, an area that was like a, the history of the NFTs. We can say we have a history yet, but uh, at least the beginnings and how. Uh, everything started, the first projects, and also the type of, of um, NFTs and how you can interact with NFTs. So we did like a 40 minutes tour and people couldn't believe like in 40 minutes, they, they yeah. said, I can't believe that now I understand, now I know. So it's important to, to, to create. To be this, open as well. To be open, so, yeah. But, yeah, yeah, but to also lower a little bit the, the uh, know how to explain and know how to, to talk to people who don't know about it because they, they are afraid and sometimes they don't want uh, uh, to, to jump in because they think they don't know about it. Yeah, they, so they, they think they, I might feel stupid actually because I don't know the definition of this or that. It, it, mm -hmm. and, you know, mm -hmm. my view is that it, you know, it doesn't matter anything. Just go in. And yeah, then exactly. You will, you will pick up the pieces as you go ahead. Yes, yeah. And you will make sense yeah. of the whole. Um, Cool. We are amazingly on time. <laughs> 1625, just <laughs> to the minutes. Um, I think we, uh, I don't know, I wonder if you agree, I, I would open up the floor yeah. for, for some Q&A, some questions. Yeah, yeah. And, uh, um, we actually had a, few, oh, cool. we had a few already that have come through. Um, and I think, funnily enough, what you've just touched on at the end, Alfredo, was one of the first ones that came through, uh, was from someone in an organization in the UK. And they didn't feel like they had a, a great understanding of NFTs at all or even like where to begin. So I think they were essentially just asking, you know, from particularly from a curatorial slash director point of view, where do you actually recommend sort of starting as a with someone with no knowledge of NFTs? Should I pin? I'll pin every speaker as well so we can take that out to everybody. Yes, uh, for me, at I started just to go online and uh, different newspapers <coughs> and forums, for instance. I mean, there is this kind of a for NFT UK is a good place to start with, which is basically a network of NFT sort of creative in the in the UK. 
and they 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 have actually um, uh, a newsletter and uh, and Instagram and Twitter. They organize a lot of pop up meetings, uh, usually in London, but not only in London. I have to say, um, and then. There are a number of newsletters actually uh, out there. I just need to kind of uh, as, as start with one, and then you will pick up the references and the names and the titles and the artists and the curators and the institution doing this and that, and then you start it from that and then and then you go home, because it's uh, it's as a way it's it's so um, um, expanded in a way that it will be like you know I don't know anything about art. Where do I start? Well, you know, start from, you know, the, I don't know, a, a magazine or just popping into a gallery or just pick up a website and, and see what's going on. It's, it's something that you have to, just a simple entry point and you can Google search NFT UK, you can, you can say, oh, artist, NFT artist. Quite a lot of artists now, contemporary artists are um, working with public institutions in terms of commissions. They, they do have actually... Refi Canada has a British Museum kind of a residency for one year to work with their collections of I don't know how many millions of objects. Are. There are actually the, all this NFT also news, they popping up in normal artistic newsletters and cultural institution newsletter. Every newsletter for whatever actually subscri subscription you have, it, there is a one or two articles about NFT and just start from that. And you know it's it's good. You know you have to invest a bit of time into that, as mm -hmm. every everything else, really. I don't know if the other you. people have any other sort of uh, specific references. I would say definitely as well is like talk to people. Um, that's certainly how I kind of properly kind of fell into the space was just having lots and lots of conversations. Um, certainly here in Manchester, there was kind of a lot of meetups like blockchain meetups which were like a lot of devs but they all were very kind <laughs> as I asked lots of stupid questions they answered them um but you know I think one lovely thing about the web3 kind of NFT space is that everyone's so welcoming and certainly I've never met someone who's not wanting to talk um and like certainly I always find I learn so much from exchange with people even today like um because the space is so temporal yeah. like things are being documented but like things happen as they like they come and if you miss it like you, you kind of need to speak to people to find out and I, I kind of love that because it forces you to be kind of part of the community rather than being kind of like a ghost <laughs> it's it's so true what you say actually the the accessibility of the of this space is amazingly uh welcoming uh which almost like you know we talk about ourselves in the art world that we know each other etc cetera, etc cetera. but for someone who's not part of the art or just to go into a museum or to go into a gallery where you have the desk and the people behind the desk looking at you it's kind of intimidating a lot of times and then never met anyone in any nft gathering to say oh what you're talking about i mean it's they're really really <laughs> really even if it's you know that art is not their expertise maybe they work with gaming or fashion or or social issues, so they, they're really, really welcome and kind of a, it's, it's an amazingly uh, warm environment, I would say in that sense. We have a, another question in the chat as well that's just come through. Um, sorry, it's, I think it's just gonna be me reading questions out, so I apologize, but um, <laughs> someone has mentioned a bit of a concern on the environmental impact. Um, so they said they believe from, from the studies that are out there already, uh, to mint one NFT could be approximately equivalent to driving about 600 miles or, you know, a thousand kilometers. So we'd love to know a little bit more about the environmental impact and how we might manage this as we go forward. Um, they mentioned that in the, the organization they work for, they're considering ephemeral, pardon me if I don't get that right, and dematerializing our production. But what does this do to our in increased impact? Um which is a great question, and I'm not sure if anyone wants to touch on that. But yeah, maybe can you can you um, mention the Tezos environmental impact, for instance, in terms of blockchain? Uh, because I don't believe that that statistic. I don't know where it comes from, but it's true. I, I don't believe it at all. I, mean, <laughs> I think it's, yeah. it's far fetched <laughs> from the reality. Um, so these numbers might come from 
before on on the on the east blockchain uh, when it was um uh, proof of work and not proof of stake um now it's a little bit different however it's still quite quite heavy i don't have the numbers but ethereum to be honest maybe francis has uh but about tezos um it actually attracted a lot of uh, artists who are also climate activists because it is uh, environmentally friendly and it, it is um, energy efficient. So um, when you talk about um, you know these big numbers um, on the east, but before um, on Tezos, like one one year of activity is the equivalent of seventeen world citizens um, of the consumption, the energy footprint of seventeen world citizens, which is very very low and. Um, the, um, the researchers working on the Tezos protocol are actually um, actively working uh, to achieve um, um, neutrality, a carbon neutrality. So that's actually something that they are. Yeah, that, that's a yeah, main uh, challenge for them. Yeah. Um, but yeah, as I, as I said, um, the Tezos blockchain was actually um, very um, appreciated by you know artists such as Joanny Le Mercier. Lately, artists such as John Gerard actually minted on Tezos as well because of this. Well, thanks to this very low carbon footprint, and I would say that the Tezos community is actually full of climate activists and and people really looking for um, you know social impact and and social environmental impact. So it's a you can you can be safe um, with this blockchain, but you know it's far from being the only one, uh, which is proof of stake. Like, and we have more and more, and now as I said, uh, Ethereum as well. But I will say the the community is highly engaged and 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 quite activist as well. Um, and they are yeah they are not afraid about that when they are actually minting on Twitter. So. I, I I agree. There is a lot of climate activists and uh, and environmental sort of a focus project on the blockchain and uh, and even Ethereum, which is the the biggest one in terms of of the, of the blockchain for artists. They went from proof of work to proof of stake. It means basically a different way to minting. Uh, somehow that it consume a much, 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 much less energy. And it's not that the art world is carbon free anyway. So uh, <laughs> so we have also to talk about that. It's, uh, there is a lot of discussion in terms of, you know, shipping and, and the publication of work and the publication of the display for the work, the display solutions. And I'm, gl I'm glad actually that the question mentioned that today they tend actually to be uh, quite uh, responsive to that in terms of uh, having the possibility to not to ship work but to produce work in situ and then to possibly uh, dismantle the work actually so it doesn't leave trace. It's something that uh, contemporary artists in my experience are taking in consideration more and more as well as institution commissioning those artists. Um, yeah I would completely, I, that was kind of what I was going to build on as well. I think like I think what we've learned from the whole kind of environmental conversation, because as Diane rightly points out, like it is, it's obviously there's still a problem because it's digital technology and digital technology is at carbon. You know, there is a problem there. But um, now with the change of the way we authenticate transactions and that is now, as they say, 99% less carbon um, emissions. But ultimately what this has highlighted is perhaps us thinking of ourselves about what does it mean to be a carbon neutral institution and actually where do we pollute um, and you know NFTs I think has just highlighted a really interesting idea of that certainly a lot of the counter arguments I saw from people in the space was talking a lot then about kind of pointing fingers about kind of art markets and art fairs and how energy intensive those kind of um, sort of uh, events are themselves um, and actually then also pointing fingers at like at DeFi or decentralized finance as well, which is actually a huge sector and actually is the main uh, use case for Ethereum in itself. Um, so it's always kind of this funny thing that it was like artists that were getting pointed at and, you know, sort of getting questioned about the environmental impact when actually they are really just a small fraction of the sector and actually are very kind of sort of conscious conscientious of the issue whilst actually i think we have a massive problem in terms of finance and the finance sector more broadly uh which yeah perhaps is like a whole other conversation <laughs> thank you everyone 
Um, so the next question we've had through is quite a lovely one, actually. It says, um, is there a hurry for the art community to jump into the NFT as a as a thing? Um, is it here to stay and therefore we shouldn't have to panic and we can embrace it calmly and within our own time? Or do we need to be rushing into it so quickly? You know, that's essentially what they're saying. I, I wouldn't rush anyone really to do anything. <laughs> There's no point, really. Uh, I think the technology is here to stay, for sure, not only in the art, but in many uh, sections of society. And uh, it will just, you know, uh, as uh, we mentioned before, is a journey. Everything, you know, kind of is evolving. There will be new projects, new, new players. Um, at some point, actually, the institution will encounter artists who wants to work with this technology. And then at that point, maybe they can jump in. The, there's no point to to rush anything. I think um, personally, I would recommend to look into that anyway. To you know, start from something and then you know, uh, investing a bit of time, understanding actually a bit how the the space is working and the different formats and the different ways. The difference between I don't know marketplace and and uh, and uh, auction houses and uh, and uh, uh, blockchains and and um, and uh, you know there are different ways in which uh, crypto can work in terms of museums and cultural institutions but there's no point to rush i mean just embrace it because it's a it's something that expands horizons for a lot of people um i think there is a question for from saira actually if i can see in the can chat. i just say as well i think like there's also Sorry. this kind of real question of like um People seem to be rewarded for being an early adopter, but I don't see the benefits of being an early adopter. In fact, it's actually much harder and you have many more barriers to climb. Um, if you don't feel confident in the technology, but you're interested in it, then like don't like there's no there's no need in being that. Like there's no badge of honor. It's like there's nothing really meaningful about it, is perhaps what I'm trying to say. Um, and certainly there's this sort of sense of, yeah, take it at your own time. Or not at all if it's not part of your practice. Brilliant. So yeah, we have had one through um, for Francis for you directly, and then I've had another one through to me privately. So I'll, I'll do the one to you, Francis, first. Um, so you're invited by Tate um, to give a talk. Sorry, my chat's a bit funny. Um, to give a talk as a their history of a South Asian multimedia artist, curator, and spokesperson. And they're hoping to work more with Tate on that. So that's great. And would love to bring Web3 into the mix. Um, but in Web3, such marginalized and unrepresented communities and role models are even more scarce. So the question to Francis and to everyone else here is what tips can you give um, such divisions to encourage the growth of this area? That's a good point, isn't it? I think what I'd say is diversity and the problem of marginalization is not a technology issue, it's a human issue. Um, and unfortunately, technology can't necessarily solve that unless um, humans change themselves. Um, but certainly, I think, um, you know, speaking of like the Tezos ecosystem, I think the way that uh, there was this platform called Hiccup Nunc arose and formed out of a kind of almost like a reaction to kind of some of the stuff that was happening in the Ethereum ecosystem. And it was bringing a lot of amazing artists from like across the globe and supporting them in ways that really what blockchain and decentralization kind of aimed to do ideologically in the first place, but unfortunately has kind of ricocheted backwards a little bit to the kind of current paradigms we find in the art market. So I think like what I'd say is there are lots of interesting platforms out there that do actually try to be a reaction in some form. It's just about kind of digging into it and finding them. I'm sure Diane could actually probably offer some interesting insight into this as well. Um, but yeah, certainly I think Hikik Milk or what is now known as the TIA community is a really good example of that. I'll dance a bit this application. Great. Um, did anyone else want to touch on? On that one before we uh, I, I was just um, mentioned that practically speaking actually from from a curatorial point of view there is also uh, you know probably um, uh, the, the resourceful we have actually in terms of the artwork is actually we can we can really uh, dive in and, and practically changing the stats somehow and as a curators we can do it and the the, the multiplicity double x nft platform actually with our own that we we 
we started last year, it was specifically actually to value diversity in the arts and, uh, and, uh, and society in general. And, uh, you know, we can talk about gender diversity and, and ethnicity and, uh, and uh, um, identity. And so it's, it's something that actually is also about um, enlarging your horizon and do somehow uh, a bit more work than the first thing that you come up your mind is, okay, I can, I can do this project with this and this and this artist because they're good. You know, you can also kind of, okay, maybe I wanted to, to look into another direction. I want to actually ex explore this, this, this other sort of area. I wanted to uh, understanding a bit more actually how this community actually works. And, uh, and it's about actually, you know, doing your homework a bit harder somehow, and uh, which is, you know, a, a very practical way to, to do it. But as a, as a curator, as, as a rector, institutional leaders, our researchers, our producers, I think we, th there is a duty actually uh, from, from us actually to, to embrace this one and, and not just actually uh, say, okay, because it's not under my radar, I cannot do it. Uh, I just reverse to default sort of a thing. It's, it's, I don't know what the others are thinking, but to me, it's pretty clear. Thanks, Alfredo. I'm going to move on to the next question because we have had quite a few coming through to me in the chat, which is great. Um, so a question from a small arts institution. If we want to launch our NFTs for fundraising purposes, is it better to launch our own platform to sell them or to collaborate with an existing one? What are the pros and cons of each scenario? And do you have any platforms that you'd recommend them pay attention to or look into? Who wants to answer? <laughs> I'm happy to jump in. I feel like I suppose some of the fundraising. Um, obviously, like I feel like I have to do a quick kind of promo for iconic moments. Um, but obviously, I think um, certainly in the kind of market that we're in at the moment, which is like a real downturn, mostly because of some of the external factors, but also because of the various crypto issues that we've had as well. Um, I think launching your own platform would be incredibly risky and not something I would recommend. Um, but certainly, I think um, if you're thinking about fundraising practices, I think it's also important to be thinking about like where are your audiences and who are your donors and where do they exist? Um, and for example, if you did work with an NFT platform, will they find that and how can you engage with them? Um, because you're not necessarily going to, it's kind of a difficult one of thinking about like, oh, well, we'll assume to, we're going to create a whole new group of people that are going to love us. Um, like you have to kind of work and marry your two audiences together, this kind of crypto world and this kind of traditional world. Um, but yes, and I think that kind of, yeah, I would say, again, like I'm happy to speak with you um, if that's something you're generally interested in doing. Um, uh, yeah, I don't know if anyone else has any other. Uh, from from an institutional on. point of view, I have, um, yeah, I, I, I do feel like, uh, yes, it's, you're right, Francis, the, 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 the NFT world and crypto world and the art world are kind of on two parallel tracks at the moment somehow, but they're kind of, a, you know, they tend to converge, they're slightly converging. There will be a point in, a, you know, in the future that they, they will be one and not two tracks. And, uh, and I'm working, for instance, at Mostyn with, uh, with uh, a next uh, artist that we are showing here, Stefan Brueggemann, on... Uh, on an NFT commission, which is part of his work, because his work is all about language, and uh, and uh, for for him, he's kind of he's a very multidisciplinary artist, and that was kind of a natural sort of uh, expansion of his practice. But we and we actually um, toyed with the idea to to launch our own NFT, but in the end, actually, we decided because he was having also some conversation with another um, uh, platform and, uh, and, uh, and marketplace and producer to do a whole, um, NFT edition cluster, let's say of 20 more works divide in a multiple edition of each of the work in the end to partner with them, uh, in order to have, you know, one of those 20 museum edition of the world will be the most in edition. And then we, we take it from there actually. And for, for us is also, um, somehow easier because they they have more capacity than us as an institution in terms of uh, uh, PR and communication for both the art world and and the crypto world they do have actually uh, more financial capacity in terms of producing the work and uh, and and for us actually it's, uh, it's it's probably more rewarding to to be associated with a kind of a prestigious project that launched worldwide 
um, and uh, and to have one edition dedicated to us for our institution, also in terms of fundraising, but not only. Um, so yes, I, I would yeah, concur with with Francis that it's better if you partner at least for the you know the the first time or the first two three times that you're working with, and then you will figure it out what is right for you or not. Yeah, completely. I think it's because it's really about it's marketing at the end of the day. And actually, like uh, there are some really innovative techniques around marketing, engaging with particular communities and partnerships, which is really integral to the success of an NFT project, which you probably don't have the contacts to be able to produce that. Whilst if you partner with someone, they can offer that and actually then secure and ensure that the project is fairly successful. And that's also the agenda of Tezos somehow to support institutions actually doing the, the, the what they need to do, um, among others. Sorry, it's not an advertisement, but you were just talking <laughs> earlier about it. <laughs> Great. So we do have two questions left, but they are quite uh, big ones, I think, especially the. So I'll do I'll do the slightly smaller one first. Okay. Um, so someone has asked, is Ethereum, I think it's pronounced, still the main currency that transactions of NFTs are paid with? Um, and is that why the carbon emissions being so high was mentioned? Because that's what they're used with. Um, and if any of the speakers or anyone in the room has any selling platforms that you'd recommend that use more eco-friendly currencies? Ethereum recently went, they, they did what it was called the merge. So it went from proof of work to proof of stake. So that the, the environmental impact of the blockchain is 90% less now. Mm. And, um, and it's uh, comparable to other actually blockchain um, platform like Tezos or um, Elementum or um, many others that I can think of now off the top of my mind. But I think it's... Uh, um, it, it's something that it's uh, it, it's sustainable in in the long run, and maybe Florenza, do, do you have any example that you would like to bring in uh, as a as a blockchain? No, sorry. <laughs> no, <laughs> no but beside these two, actually. <laughs> Yeah. Well, there's, there's no, Algorand it really, well. it really depends. It really Algorand, depends also. yeah, Algorand is, is, a, is a good, it, is a good example. And also, well. it depends on the type of art that you are doing, because uh, if you are doing generative art, you are going to be using uh, art blocks, and art blocks is a, is a particular uh, marketplace. It depends of so many, many things. It's not just that you choose uh, uh, to to work on Ethereum or 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 an, or or anything in particular. It's more, uh, you have to consider the, the blockchain, what is your product, what is your, your target audience, and then uh, come out from there. In terms of uh, pollution, now with the, with, the, with the move, like you said, we are, we are okay. It's like, it doesn't consume that much. So it's much more expensive uh, in terms of uh, pollution to go to an event and take an airplane. <laughs> than, than burning the NFT. Yeah, and and uh, <laughs> uh, different artists also will want to work with different blockchains actually exactly. because they have their own reason because maybe they used it before or for any other sort of a reason. So it's you mm. know there are many of them out there, yeah. and uh, so it's uh, it's not that kind of a, there is one size fit all. Yeah. Also, uh, but, type of the, the the type of NFT that you do if it's yeah. uh, if you want to to build in some um, some uh, special. Um, 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 uh, like a, a programming on the on the NFT, you will have to use different uh, different tools and different mm -hmm. blockchain. So yeah, yeah. yeah. And, and Tezos it's itself is one of the kind of a working with artists mm -hmm. more and more actually. Mm -hmm. and I should also say as well is that you can bridge between blockchains as well. That is, it's clunky, but you can do it. And actually, it's something that a lot of people are working on. So actually this thing of like this conversation of which blockchain to work on actually is going to hopefully eventually be irrelevant because you can switch between them easily. Um, but yeah, the technology is not quite there yet in terms of making that user-friendly. The, the oh, so-called interoperability can... yeah. <laughs> in, in jargon. <laughs> and if I can add a little bit of a timeline here, um, at Tezos, we are testing in and it will be yet yeah, tested in May, and then it will become public in September. So I think this will definitely uh, uh, make all, all our interactions uh, on different blockchains way more smoother. <laughs> Excellent. 
Thank you. So we have one last question, and it, it is it's quite a philosophical question. Um, will AI generated art ever really be considered as true contemporary art when at the end of the day it is a product of algorithms and data? Um, and they've said, I love AI art, so I have nothing against AI artists, but only if it has a utility. And they wanted us to explore a little bit about the ethics of auth authorship and ownership of AI generated artworks and what that might look like in the next few years. Great. Aurunda, yes. <laughs> <laughs> so then I'm not expert about AI, but recently, um, I went to the World Economic Forum because they asked me to talk, to give a talk there. And there I met a lot of um, visionary entrepreneurs about artificial intelligence. And they spoke a lot about uh, sentimental economy, metaphysical economy, empathic economy that maybe can impact, uh, can mix with artificial intelligence and um, because my point is not to make the artificial intelligence more empathic, but make the human more empathic. It's, it's yeah, it is a philosophical question. In yeah. the end, um, uh, I think it won't be much different than when they invented the printer press, really. Yeah, exactly. Uh, the, 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 I think it's, it's something that is a tool, is mm -hmm. not is not an end uh, a product, and uh, its artists will will uh, will learn actually to use this tool as they learn to use I don't know video, or <laughs> or, yeah, actually, or, or any other technology really. For instance, exactly. Um, it's it's going to be at the end about the, the creativity and about the, the concept and the story behind um, the artwork more than the, the technology, because the technology is a tool. Like we said, when, when, when we saw the digital camera was the same. Uh, when, like I'm doing a project now called Being Human. And uh, actually it's, it's creating, I think we learn more about ourselves with this technology because when you have to to create uh, artificial intelligence, you have to ponder about wh what does it mean to be human? How do we transfer um, what we are and our, our knowledge and our um, uh, um, values and our culture into, into these systems? And by pondering on these questions, we learn more about ourselves. Yeah. So I think, yeah. It is a good point. It's kind of a, this type of technology forces us to ask harder questions about mm -hmm. ourselves mm -hmm. and uh, and our place in the world and uh, mm -hmm. what is some sort of a cultural um, uh, I don't know, expression and well, why, why do we want to do it in what form, etc. So I, I do think it's mm -hmm. is not uh, it won't take away actually from 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 contemporary art. It will add a layer of complex of complexity if you want actually to that. It and I think also, yeah, go ahead, sorry. Go, go. But I was going to say, like, you know, I think the real question really comes to this is the thing that has been on our minds with AI the whole time is, and that's like who's training it and what biases are embedded into those. Mm -hmm. um, I have a colleague at, um, he's actually over at the music school who started his PhD at the same time as me. And I love his work because he trained his own AI using his music. So the AI is essentially almost like an extension of him. So talking about the idea of human. Um, and I think that in itself mm -hmm. then becomes a really great period of terms of ownership because it's like, it's almost him in the robotic form. <laughs> but then it's, you know, people using kind of, you know, chat GBT, um, you know, that becomes another question entirely. And the sort of, sort of, you know, I'm just kind of slightly concerned about people using it in such an objective way when actually it's got huge bias that we're not really necessarily thinking about. That is a journey, right? I mean, there will be more and more people working on it and mm -hmm. in terms of kind of devising the, the database and, and the ethical implication of the database is it, something that, you know, it, it won't stop. We, we just need to address it actually as we go ahead, I think. Brilliant. I think that's a really good um, ending note, to be honest. So thank you very, very much. Does anyone have any final comments from our speaker panel or Alfredo or Runda? Do you have anything you wanted to close with? 
No, it was been very pleasure actually to have this chat. I really enjoyed it. <laughs> Great. Well, I just want to say thank you. Yeah, to me too. As well. And thank you so much to the speakers. You were absolutely fantastic. And it's really great thank to you. hear work from everywhere. Thank you. So we'll let you all go. Thank you very much for joining us today. Thank you. Thanks a lot. Bye-bye. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.